All right, what's up guys? Today we're gonna to be talking about titrations. Uh, titrations are a super important topic and I hate that because of COVID-19, um, we're not gonna to get to actually do this lab. I'm hoping in the summer we're gonna get ASAM to help us um, do this lab, but we will see. So titrations are simply a way to determine the concentration of some substance dissolved into water or dissolved into some other substance. So determine the concentration of things. So obviously that would be very important um, when you're mixing any chemicals or if you're trying to figure out, for example, how much of some chemical is in some type of cough medicine. Well, pharmacists would be very important for them to know how to do a titration to figure out, or the FDA, to determine the concentration that actually are in medicines to test them for accuracy. To measure blood sugar levels, you could determine, you know, dissolved substances into blood. That's obviously medically important. And then what we're going to focus on today, a scenario where we're going to determine the concentration of a acid in a chemical spill. So that would also be another way to use this. And then the food industry, obviously, to determine the various concentrations of substances in foods and vitamins, which clearly you see the relevance to. So the setup for a titration, or at least what, what I do in lab when I order the labs through ASIM, is they have it set up this way. And this is probably the most common way to do a titration. You have a burette up top filled with some substance. Um, typically, you'll see a base in this burette. So this doesn't have anything in it, but it would be filled up. This is actually after the titration has taken place, but you're usually gonna have some left over. It's gonna be filled up with a base. And then down here, typically you'll have an acid. This is a very common way to do a titration. You've got a valve to adjust how much of this base do you want to allow to drip into your acidic solution. And essentially what you're gonna do is you're gonna add this base to the acid until you get a color change. Um, the color is going to change based on what type of indicator you use. And a very common indicator for an acid-based titration is something called phenolphthalein. Phenolphthalein turns pink when you reach the equivalence point. And when you go too far over the equivalence point, heading towards the end point, and after, and after that, it's going to turn uh, red. So our really, really dark, deep fuchsia pink. Um, so anyway, this is a t basic titration. You add a base to an acid. Um, you can you can see it adding here. You want to go drop by drop. If you add too much, you may go over the equivalence point. We'll talk about what that is. You don't have to have a super precise setup like we just saw. Sometimes you can just use a dropper. As long as you know exactly how much you drop into the solution. Because that's the key here, is knowing how much acid or base you've used to titrate your solution with. So this is the general setup that um, we usually have when I order labs from ASIM. This is what basically what they bring to you, and you guys have done very similar things, working with pH probes and pH meters and whatnot. So you've got your ring stand, you've got your burette. In this case, they're using a strong base, right? Sodium hydroxide, strong base, group one, one or two metals is one of our strong bases, and we're using that to titrate a strong acid, right? Hickel, Hibber, High. This is one of our binary strong acids. And these are the results on the pH meter as the reaction takes place. So if you notice on the x-axis here, we have volume of sodium hydroxide in mils. So how much base are we using to titrate our acid here in the beaker? Now if you look at the pH probe at the beginning, before we've added any sodium hydroxide, the pH is really low, meaning we have an acid. It's below 2, which means that it's a strong acid, and that fits um, the substance we're working with, right? We're using hydrochloric. Now, as we add more sodium hydroxide, notice what happens to the pH. The pH very, very slowly increases until eventually we have this super steep slope. And what's happening is you're adding a base, but because you already have so much hydrochloric acid in there, it's resisting a change in pH because you still have that H plus ions causing the P interacting with the pH probe to indicate that your pH is low. So you've got to add a lot of sodium hydroxide to overcome all those H plus ions. Now, once you've added, for example, 40 mils of sodium hydroxide, you'll notice your pH is extremely high. Well, you're dealing with a, you're adding a strong base. So once you've dissolved so much of that strong base in there, 
the pH is going to basically indicate exactly the pH of that strong base in its original solution. Now the important point here that we're looking at is right here. This is called the equivalence point. Okay, the equivalence point is where your H plus concentration is equal to your OH negative concentration. At this point, an interesting equation that you've seen before, M1V1 equals M2V2, is what we're going to use to calculate the molarity of the acid in our beaker. So key points here are the equivalence point. That's where H plus equals OH negative. At this point, you get a very interesting interaction between your phenolphthalein indicator. So if you look at this little giphy I have up here in the top, if phenolphthalein turns pink at the equivalence point, now as you're adding the sodium hydroxide, when it interacts with that phenolphthalein before it dissolves, it's going to look like pink drops are hitting the solution, the HCl solution in the bottom. But once you stir it up, it neutralizes that, it takes it away, and it becomes an acidic solution again. Now the pH is slowly rising, but we haven't reached that equivalence point yet. What happens when you're doing these titrations is eventually you're going to add a one single drop of sodium hydroxide and the entire solution is going to turn pink and when you mix it up it's going to stay pink and that's how you know you've reached the equivalence point. So if you look at down here at the three solutions we have, the equivalence point is that regular, almost a faded pink color. Once it stays pink you know you're at the equivalence point. When it's really, really faint, light pink or the pink goes away when you mix it up, you're probably somewhere in here. You haven't reached the equivalence point yet. And you know you've gone too far if your solution gets red, you've hit the end point and beyond, and your solution is just it's getting too dark. So it's this sweet spot. And this sweet spot at the equivalence point is found really with one single drop you add. It's going to turn pink and it's going to stay pink. So the scenario for you today is you have hydrochloric acid spill in some factory, chemical supply company factory you work for. We'll use that example again. And your boss says, okay, go determine the concentration of that solution. Uh, we were mixing it up and we don't know how far we got. So maybe you can salvage the rest of the barrel, but you got to know what the concentration is now so you can mix up your chemicals later on. So what you're going to have is the same setup we looked at earlier. You've got a burette with sodium hydroxide. And in the beaker, you're going to scoop up from that chemical spill a certain amount of whatever acid you have. Obviously, you need to know the volume that you have here. That's going to be your V2. Obviously, with the sodium hydroxide, we know how much we're using in the burette, and we should know the molarity. Sorry, this is going to be V1 and M1. We should know that about our sodium hydroxide. We know V2. We don't know the molarity of this, right? The whole point is we're going to try to calculate that. We can't figure out the molarity until we get to the equivalence point. At this point, M1V1 equals M2V2 equation works. It doesn't work anywhere else, okay? It only works here because those quantities actually, these two sides of the equations will actually be equal. But at different points, it's not going to be the case. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick different points on this graph and we're going to determine what the molecular view of that solution in this beaker is actually going to look like. So at this very beginning, when we first stick that pH probe into the solution, we are here. We're at a pH of, it says 1.3 on our pH meter. If you look in the actual beaker here, we've got, this is just for example, maybe three moles of H and Cl. Obviously you wouldn't know this until the end, but for the purposes of explanation, this is what it would look like. So you've got nothing but HCl, and that makes sense. You haven't added, excuse me, you haven't added sodium hydroxide yet. So until you add it, obviously you're not going to have any sodium hydroxide ions. But let's take a different point. Let's say we go up to here. So now we've added about 12 mils of sodium hydroxide. And then we look at our molecular view of the solution. Now we've got sodium hydroxide ions in there. But we still have more hyd hydrogen ions and chloride ions in comparison to the sodium hydroxide. And if you have more H plus ions, your pH should be below 7 because we're not neutral. And that makes sense for where we are here. So what is the color of the solution going to look like? It's still going to be somewhere in here, right? We haven't added enough sodium hydroxide to make our phenolphthalein indicator turn that deep pink that we're looking for at the equivalence point. 
But what happens if we move this arrow to the equivalence point? Well, a few things are going to change. In our molecular view of our solution, now we've got equal quantities of hydrogen ions, chlorine ions, and sodium and hydroxide ions. It's all equal. And if all of those are equal, then your pH should be 7. You've got equal quantities of a strong base and a strong acid. And those two things will, that key term we talked about, neutralize each other. So now the solution pH is not going to be dangerous levels. It's neutralized. The pH is 7. Um, so anyway, what is the color of the solution going to actually look like now at the equivalence point? If you're right at the equivalence point, you just added a drop, you mix up the barrette, maybe you've got a magnetic stir in there somewhere in the bottom of that solution like we use in lab, and it just stays pink. So now you know you're at the equivalence point. You haven't gone too far, it hasn't reached that red yet, that initial drop. When you get there, this is what the solution is going to look like. Neutral solution, equivalence point, color pink. Now if you go too far, let's say you made a mistake, you'll know it because your color is going to be way too dark pink or almost a red color and your pH is going to be somewhere around 12 you know between 10 and 12 so you know you've gone way too far so maybe we're here on our arrow if we look at the molecular view of the solution you'll notice we have way more sodium and hydroxide ions than we do the HCl ions and in a solution right the power of hydroxide or the power of hydrogen is really low then you've ended up with a lot of sodium and hydroxide ions. Your pH is going to be really, really high, uh, which would be indicated by these, these ions would cause that to happen with your pH meter. So if you didn't go too far, though, and you're at the equivalence point, well, that's what we care about. Why do we care about it? Again, this equation works here. M1V1 equals M2V2. And remember, the whole point of this scenario was that you had a chemical spill, and you were trying to figure out M2 or the concentration of this chemical spill. So what do we know in this equation? Well, we know M1, right? We know the molarity of the base that we are using. Hopefully it was from some stock solution that was accurate. You know the volume of that base. How much of that base did you add to the acid? That's your V1. M1, V1, non-quantities, right? Remember going back to equations, what do you know, what do you not know? We know V2. We know how much of this acid we scooped up into our beaker and then used in our experiment. The only thing we don't know is the molarity of this unknown acid that was spilled. So we can use this equation to solve for M2. So let's say you had to add 100 mils, to make the math easy, of one molar sodium hydroxide to 50 mils of your acid in the beaker. So that's what you had to use to reach your equivalence point. Well, we can use this equation. So let's move some things out of the way and do the math. So you've got 100 milliliters for V1, one molar concentration equal to M2, we don't know, times V2 of 50 milliliters. So we can just divide by 50 milliliters on both sides. It's going to cancel out. M2 is going to equal a concentration of 2 molar. And sig figs, we only have one sig fig, so it would just be 2m. So again, we can figure out the concentration of that acid using this procedure. And I know this procedure may be an unlikely scenario. But if you're working for the FDA and you're trying to figure out how much of vitamin C is in this, you know, maybe emergency, those little vitamin mixes, well, it's important that we check and make sure that what's written on that label, the concentration of vitamin C, is actually correct. So we could take that packet, dissolve it in water, and then run our calculations. Um, so it's very important and it's very useful. And yes, we should have got a, an M2 of 2 molar. So again, titration results, important things. You've got to have a indicator. Excuse my penmanship. Writing on the iPad is not uh, the easiest thing in the world with this little stylus I have. Uh, you've got to have this setup here, something similar. pH probe is vital. And then you just start adding whatever you're using to titrate your solution with. So strong acid, strong base, you're going to get this type of curve.
Now you can tell exactly what happened by just looking at the curve, right? If we look at this curve, we know they started pH less than two, they had a strong acid in that solution. And by the end of it, it ended up being a pH of 12 to 13, they were clearly adding a strong base. Now if you saw the opposite curve, something that started way up here, took a nosedive, and then leveled out below two, then that means they had the opposite situation here, where they had the strong acid in the burette, and they were adding it to a strong base. And we would know that because you would start with a high pH. And that would be right some type of strong base, since it's higher than 12. And you know they were titrating with an acid because it ended up being less than two. So it ended up being a strong, a strong acid. So again, titrations. They help us determine what value? M2, molarity of the concentrated solution. And typically it's going to be pretty high. It could be low though. When we did this calculation, we got a molarity of 2. It could be any value. It just depends on how much you had to use uh, to titrate your final solution. So anyway, that's it. Uh, this is titrations. If you have any questions, please let me know in the comment section below.